Bonsoir, bonsoir tout le monde et, et bienvenue. Um, good evening and welcome. It's my privilege to introduce this upcoming panel discussion. Entitled, as you see here, A Galaxy Within, Single Cell Genomics Open a New Frontier to Understanding the Brain. My name is Leslie Fellows and I'm Vice President Health Affairs and Dean of the McGill's Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Um, as a neurologist and neuroscientist myself, I'm particularly pleased to be here this evening. Uh, I was I was seeing patients in clinic actually this afternoon, and uh, I was reflecting as I did that, that and as I do pretty much every week, um, about how much, on the one hand, how much we've learned about the brain, but also, um, and perhaps more importantly, how much remains to be learned, uh, that we are far from having all the answers we need to make a difference uh, for patients, despite the progress that we've, we've already made. Um, Mardi prochain, le 9 novembre 2024, le neuro célébra le 40e anniversaire du Centre d'imagerie cérébrale McConnell, the McConnell Brain Imaging Center. And that occasion uh, provides an example of the progress that we have made and the work that we must continue to do to ensure discoveries that will make a difference to patients who suffer from mental health or neurological conditions. Uh, the example of the Brain Imaging Center is, you know, shows in just about 30 or 40 years, really, uh, we've gone from remarkably rudimentary x-rays of brain structures to extraordinarily detailed, multifaceted understanding of how the brain works in terms of complex, dynamic networks that are constantly changing. Um, and that, I guess, is just an illustration at a level that, that I can understand as someone who does cognitive neuroscience. Um, one of the lessons from the brain imaging is, is that new methods drive new understanding. And I think that tonight we're going to get a glimpse of the potential of uh, really exciting new methods that allow characterization of the brain uh, one cell at a time, uh, which is uh, both daunting and very exciting uh, way to think about uh, or to make progress in our understanding of the brain. Before we get into the event, I'd like to acknowledge and remind us all that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. McGill acknowledges and thanks the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence has enriched this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. L'Université McGill is située sur un territoire qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les peuples autochtones notamment les Haudenosaunee et les Anishinaabe. Nous saluons et remercions les divers peuples autochtones qui ont enrichi leur présence ce territoire accueillant aujourd'hui des gens de partout dans le monde. These land acknowledgements serve really as a reminder to collectively learn from the perspectives of Indigenous communities and to draw on those perspectives as we build a path forward in the spirit of reconciliation and engagement. Uh, it's in this spirit that I'd like to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, a collaboration between the Ledmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health and its three partner institutions, the Lady Davis, um, uh, more formally, the Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research at the Jewish General Hospital, the Neuro, Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital, and the Douglas, uh, the Douglas Research Center of the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. I, I think it's great that these three uh, institutes all kind of have nicknames. Um, the Ludmer Center was founded in 2013 thanks to a generous donation from the Irving Ludmer Family Foundation. And the mission of the Ludmer Center is to bring together multidisciplinary researchers to drive forward collaborative and global big data research. And you're going to get a glimpse shortly of what that means in the, in the context of single cell genomics. Since 2013, the center has made significant progress in building the core infrastructure to strengthen and reinforce partnerships and collaborations to further our understanding of normal and abnormal brain development. With the combined strength of its partner institutes, the Ludmer Center brings together experts in functional genomics, epigenetics, neuroimaging, biostatistics, neuroinformatics, and single cell genomics. I'd like to thank our founding donors, Mr. Irving Ludmer and Ms. Freema Lander. Uh, they're with us in spirit tonight. Unfortunately, uh, circumstances prevented them from joining us uh, in person. But their generosity uh, continues to enable us to advance and champion mental health and brain research. And in fact, thanks to a, a new donation from the Irving Ludmer Family Foundation, in 2022, the Ludmer Center launched the Single Cell Genomics Brain Initiative. 
And this new venture is uh, serving, already serving, and will serve as a hub for research in single cell genomics and will allow the recruitment of nine new faculty members across the three partner institutes. And you'll be hearing from Stephanie Zandi, the first new member to join the single cell genomic brain initiative of the Ludmer Center tonight in our panel. And it's thanks to visionary donors like Mr. Ludmer and Ms. Lander that McGill can continue to raise the bar in mental health and brain research. Um, the panel discussion uh, tonight is going to put single cell genomic research into perspective and, and give you a sense of what, where this method or this approach uh, can take us. This may be a new term for some of you. Um, I've learned much more about single cell genomics than I was expecting, as Dean, I have to say. Uh, it's been actually very interesting. I hope tonight's discussion will give you a good idea of what this technique is really about and how it could shed light into the mysteries of the brain. Uh, leading the panel tonight is uh, Dr. Gustavo Tarecki. I did my cue, Maria. You may know him as the scientific director of the Douglas Research Institute or as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at McGill. He's also director of the McGill Group for Suicide Studies and co-director of the Douglas Bell Canada Brain Bank. And somehow he still manages to make time to be one of the co-directors of the Ludmer Center, leading the Single Cell Genomic Brain Initiative. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Gustavo Tarecki. Thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, fellows, uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to be um, in this panel and uh, facilitating discussion. Um, I uh, like uh, us to uh, begin, you know, we have uh, a um, panel on uh, a galaxy within single cell genomics, open a new frontier uh, to understand the brain. So this is actually a very appropriate name. Uh, it is appropriate because, you know, you may or may not know that um, the brain has more neurons than actually a galaxy has stars. So it's a very appropriate name, but it's also very appropriate because uh, um, Irving Ladmer and uh, Freema Lander, who unfortunately couldn't join us uh, tonight, are passionate about physics. And if you know Irving a little bit, uh, you would know that uh, he's uh, passionate about quantum physics, about uh, the galaxy, about uh, the stars and everything. So this was really, you know, a way to, when we were thinking about uh, tonight and thinking about, you know, how we're going to organize the day and how we're going to organize discussion, it was like a very natural name to, um, um, to give to the, uh, to the panel tonight. So what is exactly single cell genomics? Yes, and why do we need single cell genomics? So, um, so this is a study that was done very recently, uh, a few months ago, published in the um, the um, journal Science. That it was a collaboration with between Google and uh, a series of scientists at uh, at Harvard that took a cubic millimeter from the brain and slice that cubic, so it's really a very small piece of the brain, and slice it in 5,000 times, and then image that with electron microscopes, and then with artificial intelligence, that piece of the brain was reconstructed. And what you see here is that within one cubic you know, millimeter of the brain, you have 57,000 cells, yes, with uh, 150 million synapses. So that gives you an idea of how complex is our brain, yes? And so um, when you zoom in into one single neuron, that's what you see is that one single neuron has uh, connects to so many other neurons and many other cells, yes, within the brain, that gives us really a very, very complex structure of the brain. So if we go about studying the brain and take a sample of the brain and study it, yes, what we're going to get is all this complexity. 
So one way that we can reduce this complexity and transform this complexity in a way that makes a bit more sense, yes, is to separate each of these thousands of cells that are compacted and connected together, yes? So, you know, luckily, uh, you know, within the last 10 years or so, technologies have allowed us to do that, exactly that, is separate the different cells and make sense of all of this complexity. And so collectively, these techniques are known as single cell genomics. So basically, I'm mean, not gonna get into all the details of the technique, but just to give you an idea of how, you know, using, for instance, this is called drop sick. It's a technique that within, you know, you capture a single cell within a drop of oil, yes? And when you capture a cell within a drop of oil, then you can include a series of markers, molecular markers, we call them barcodes, just like the same way you eat barcodes in the supermarket. And then you can uh, do a lot of things with that and understand the cell, uh, um, the tissue, you know, one cell at a time. So this type of technology really allowed us to um, dissect this complexity and, and take the cells, which can then be analyzed in many different ways you want. So let me just give you one example, yes, and this is within my area of interest, which is in mental health, and more specifically in depression. And this is a study that Anjali Chala in my lab has just completed, yes? So using this technology, using single cell technology, Anjali was able to look at and uh, at what is open, yes, within the genome. So what is being read, uh, what is being analyzed within the genome, and that gives us an idea about what is active within a cell. And so it was by using this, and you know, I'm not gonna give you all the details, but, but using this type of technique that Anjali came to realize that in fact, in depression, there's one specific cell type Yes, there seems to be particularly uh, differentially activated. Yes, and this is one, you know, it's one type of neurons that are in, uh, in a deeper layer of the cortex, uh, and these are, uh, you know, neurons that are excitatory um, and that function by responding to stress and sending signals, and that's only possible because we use this type of technology, yes? So the availability of single cell genomics allows us to do things and discover things that with other techniques we were not able to do before, okay? So now that you are all experts in single cell genomics, let me, I uh, uh, have the pleasure to uh, invite our panelists. So uh, the first, uh, Professor uh, Kleinman, Claudia Kleinman, who is uh, uh, a associate professor in the Department of Human Genetics, a scientist at the Lady Davis uh, Institute, the Jewish General Hospital, uh, an associate member of the McGill Center for Translational Research in Cancer and the Siegel Center Center, and, um, and also a, a co-director of the Genomics, Bioinformatics, and Statistical Genetics at the Ludmer Center. So, Professor Kleiman, go ahead. And the other panelist is uh, Professor Stephanie Zandi, who uh, is um, a scientist at the Research Institute of the uh, McGill University Health Research uh, Health Center, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology and a scientist at the Neuro. And as the Dean Fellows just mentioned, is the first recruit of the Single Cell Initiative. So please uh, um, join me in welcoming Professor Zandi. Very good. Here and, uh, oops, sorry. So maybe we can start, and why don't you, each of us, tell, tell us a little bit about your work and how you use single cell genomics, maybe uh, Claudia. Thank you, Gustavo, can you hear me well? 
Yeah, so I'm uh, Claudia, I'm a computational biologist at the Lady Davis Institute. Computational biologist means that we have a dry lab, uh, all computational, but we associate with clinicians that provide samples, patient samples with the laboratories around the world, 25 at McGill and 25 around the world, who will provide the expertise in experiments, mouse models, cell lines, and so what we'll do is the integration of all this data that comes from all these different labs to try to come up with explanations on why diseases happen, how they happen, and what can we do about them. We focus on mainly two big families of diseases, which is brain tumors and uh, neurodevelopmental disease. We choose them because these are very, very deadly. Uh, most of the tumor types that we study, the uh, Kids and babies will die within two years, 5% only survive. Uh, the same for many neurodevelopmental disease. Uh, symptoms are very, very debilitating. So these are uh, severe disease that we haven't made progress over the last 30 or 40 years. So we think that our methods may make a change, that we have to go back to the drawing board and try to understand these diseases. The way we do it is we go back to brain development and try to understand brain development really, really in, in a lot of detail. And we are using for several years now these technologies. So what we do is we take normal brain developmental samples from human, mouse, and different species. We look at many, many, many cells at a time, all the genes. We do a lot of data analysis. And then once we have a really, really high resolution map or blueprint, or some roadmap of what the normal should be, then we take the disease samples and try to map them and understand what's wrong in light of what we understood. So that's in a nutshell <laughs> what we do, a lot of computational analysis, uh, but uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, you? Tell us a little bit about your work and uh, how do you use single cell genomics in your work? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for all the nice introductions. Oh, I forgot that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I started very recently um, in July as an assistant professor, so it's all still very new. Um, my lab focuses on a disease called multiple sclerosis. Um, this is an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system, which means that um, your white blood cells start attacking your brain and your spinal cords. So, of course, not supposed to do that. Um, we still know very little about why MS uh, starts, how it starts, how it works. Um, what we do know is that the immune system uh, causes inflammation in the brain, and it causes damage in the brain in the form of uh, lesions. So these are damaged areas. And my lab is uh, very interested in understanding how these lesions develop, because we don't really understand um, what governs lesion location, the timing of the lesions. Um, we do know if we look at MS population as a whole, that it's a very heterogeneous disease. Um, people can have different forms of MS. Uh, some people start with relapsing, remitting. This means they get like an inflammatory uh, insult in their brain or spinal cord. Um, they get a little bit more uh, delibitated, as in like they might lose sight or their arm is not functioning properly anymore all of a sudden. Uh, and then this sort of stabilizes again and the patient gets a bit better again. And this can go on over time and the patient can become more progressive in which we think the immune system plays a little bit less of a role, but we do think there's still inflammation in the brain itself from cells within the brain. Um, and this can then become secondary progressive. And here the patients just become like they're doing less and less well. There's also a form that's called primary progressive. And in this form, patients start out like that from the get go, they just get like insult after insult. Um, and we don't really understand so much what's causing the difference. It could be partly due to like where these lesions are located in the brain. It could be also due to the number of lesions present. So what I'm trying to understand is like, okay, where are these lesions in what part of the disease? How do they develop? Like what is the biology behind it? Um, we do know that certain areas in the brain are more affected by these lesions. We also know that certain areas are more tied to patients doing worse. So if we can find biological factors to understand that, um, we can hopefully find new therapies to treat MS patients, as well as like new ways of trying to monitor the patient. Because for the clinicians, it's actually quite hard to understand when is a patient going from this relapsing remitting phase to like a more progressive phase. And for this, we use single cell sequencing. 
So um, my speciality is human brains. Um, I have led a brain bank. I've been the head of an autopsy team uh, at uh, the Centre de Serge de Chum in uh, Montreal here, actually. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I really, I use brains from patients who have passed away and who very generously donated their brains for us to actually understand these lesions better. And uh, yeah, that's what my lab is diving into. Very good. So why don't you both tell us a little bit, what is that um, single cell genomics can contribute to the work that you do um, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to have in terms of understanding first, and then we can maybe address as well in terms of uh, future therapeutics and, uh, and capacities you know, to intervene. Um, yeah, so it, it, like single, single cell genomics uh, gives us a lot of like uh, extra information about different cell types. Um, we can actually look at all the different uh, cell types that are present in the brain, like the neurons, astrocytes, microglia. We can now start to look at them in depth and actually understand what is different between these cells if you look at different brain regions, for example, because these cells are not all the same everywhere in your brain. They have particular functions, and single cell helps us really understand that, for example. But maybe you can help, you know, not everybody here uh, understands things in detail uh, or, or are familiar with uh, the technology. Why is that before, let's say, you, you know, you couldn't study these different cell types. Mm -hmm. Why is that, you know, these technologies allowing you to do that? Yeah, so a lot of the other techniques that we were using before were more general. So they allow us to look at like a microscopic level. For example, brain imaging, we can use MRIs, we can see where lesions are, but we cannot look at cell-cell interactions, we cannot look at individual cells to understand what's really going mm -hmm. on. So what single cell allows us is allows us to look at these interactions in depth and really look at every cell by itself to see what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Claudia? If, uh, if I can add to that, there's two major things that happen with single cell. The first one is we can look at each cell at a time and also that we can look at a lot of cells at a time. So we have a lot of data coming out, so imagine you have your car and it's not working well, would you take it to the mechanic and tell, it, tell them, just something is wrong with my car, but you're not allowed to open it. Just <laughs> guess what is it from the outside. Uh, we as scientists, we want to open there at the parts and look at all the parts and see which one is working not well. So the brain has millions and billions of cells. Cell types are hundreds or thousands. So a black box that tells us this part of the brain is not working well is not enough. We want to separate them. Uh, but what changed a lot the, the game was uh, when we could look at 10,000 cells per sample. So if I get one patient, I get 10,000 or 20,000 cells. In each cell, I can look at 5,000 genes. That means that for one patient, I get a matrix that has 5 million data points. So that changed a lot the game because also there's a parallel uh, development uh, in the world that I think everybody's familiar, which is uh, AI and all these machine learning uh, developments. So we can marry the two, and now we get a lot of information for every single sample, for every single mouse, for every single human. And so that's, I think that's what changed. We can look mm -hmm. at each part, and also thousands and thousands of parts for a single patient. Mm -hmm. Very that good. Makes the, uh, and do you think that with single cell would be uh, or single cell technologies will help us better develop uh, interventions, treatments, or discover um, you know, ways to uh, uh, better treat the conditions that uh, we are studying? So eventually, yes. Uh, what happened, those are very recent. So we're in the phase where we're not able to ask questions we couldn't ask before because we didn't have the tools. I would love to know, you know, coming back to your galaxy uh, analogy, if there's life in other galaxies, but we can't go there. So 10 years ago, we had questions we couldn't ask because we didn't have the tools. Now we have them. So now we're having a lot of fun answering those questions. And slowly, it's coming into uh, treatable interventions that we can make. So I can think of a few diseases where the specific cell type was identified or in my field with the brain tumors, 
for each tumors that look like this, the same type of tumor, now we're separating them into different, very, very specific subtypes, and each one will get a different treatment or a different way of studying them. So we're getting there, it's very recent, but uh, I think yes. Um, mm -hmm. That's my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> very good. What about you? Yeah, I, th I think we are definitely slowly going towards that. Um, if I can give an example of the field of MS, uh, there was like a big study, one of the first ones that came out, got everybody super excited because um, they, they found that this one particular cell type in the brain, an astrocyte, and this cell type normally gives support to the other cells in the brain. We never really looked at that so much in MS. We just thought it was a bit of a bystander thing. It actually turned out that there was a small subpopulation of these kind of cells that were driving partly MS. Well, not exactly to that point yet, but we can see that they're contributing to disease far more than what we thought because they were actually secreting um, certain proteins that were attracting the immune system to the brain. And of course, this is not what you want, and this is partly what's wrong in MS. So when we found this out, we were like, oh, that's really interesting. We didn't realize this was actually playing a role. And yeah, so it helps us understand far better like about cell types we might have not thought about mm -hmm. playing a role. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, let's say that you know today people get really excited about single cell genomics and you know somebody contacts uh, Advancement or Miguel and say, look, I want to give lots of millions to support this research, yes? <laughs> what, how would that help advance you know, both your research problems? You want to take this first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, it, would, it would definitely help a lot. Um, single cell sequencing, even though the, it's been developed a lot, it's uh, still quite costly to do these experiments. Um, there's also a, an additional kind of sequencing, it's called spatial sequencing. And this is actually becoming more and more important. Um, in single cell sequencing, we take the organ that we're studying apart in all these single cells. In spatial sequencing, uh, we still look at one cell at a time, but we keep it in the tissue. So we can actually see which cells are next to each other, which cells are interacting. And this is something I would love to do more, to understand like interactions between the different cells in the brain. So that would definitely help with that. Yes, very good. And, and how much would you need, let's say, to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> for yeah, some of these, like one slide costs about $3,000 to give okay. you an idea. And it fits like about this much tissue. <laughs> so if you really want to do mm -hmm. a, a big study to get like enough information, um, qu quite a bit of money. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> Claudia, what yeah. about you? Yeah, the same, uh, similar things. Uh, technologies right now are still expensive. They, they decrease in cost because they are being developed. So there's a decreasing cost of technologies. They're still expensive right now. There's development on decreasing costs. There's challenges. So there's a number of uh, pro uh, international projects, you know, similar to what happened with the human genome in uh, 20 years ago that all the labs in the world went together and coordinately sequence the human genome, and we're here because of that effort. There are similar efforts going on right now with the Human Cell Atlas uh, and other initiatives like that. We are part of those, but those have gaps. So for instance, pediatric brains are not there because they're, easy, they're not so easy to uh, obtain, et cetera. So that's an example that has been covered by Chan Zuckerberg. They identify that gap when needing generating data there, mm -hmm. and now we have the pediatric cell atlas, but there are some gaps also for you know specific diseases, areas that are not being covered, but this international community would be great if McGill can lead the that, generation of data in those areas. That in fact could areas. be even transformational in the sense exactly. that it could help so, to you know, advance things that right now are not possible. We, we, working yeah. with the international community, but you know, doing our parts because uh -huh. we identify some parts that are missing. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other part that is very, very important that is coming, is here but is coming, is that there's a lot of data generation, a lot of wet lab technology development, and then we need uh, to bridge the gap between all the labs and doing this interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot of effort and, you know, we, that, that's where we typically ask funding for, you know, in the big agencies, so these interdisciplinary projects that can mix all Very these, good. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and, and what do you think 
things are going, you know, from now on, you know, because I think it's important maybe for all of us to understand, you know, are these technologies mature? Are things, you know, being developed? You know, and what else can come, you know, in the pipeline, you know, in the future? I mean, how do you see things evolve? So it's a very, very, very active field, very dynamic. Uh, technologies move, move, move very fast. So what was very new last year, this year, is a little bit obsolete because they're making progress. So we discussed these spatial technologies. Luckily, we have uh, new people coming to McGill that will deal with the technology development on that part. So we're making progress on... We were very, very high level today, and we said, we look at the cells inside. We didn't tell you what we are looking in the cells. So right now we're looking at how, many, how the genes go up and down, but the new technologies allow us to look at more things in the cell. So first there's technology that are coming, but where the field is going is two ways. What aspects we're looking inside the cell, what does it mean the galaxy within? And the second is what do we do with that data because it is a lot of data. So there's a lot of development or need to develop how we use that data, because as everybody knows, data is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. So we're on the data collection right now and trying to make sense, and now we need to put it in the context of the connectivity maps and all that to get meaning and, and, and get you know, real, you know, the bang for our bucks. So I think that's where the field is going right now, integrating to what understand is. how each cell communicate with each other uh, and, and the different cells. And, you know, and put mm -hmm. together that information with the other information we have on the brain. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the computational or analytical, putting mm -hmm. everything together. Very good. Yeah. And your yeah, thoughts? Just to follow up on that, yeah. actually, uh, something that I find very fascinating as well, not just to take this single cell sequencing data, um, but actually to integrate it with other forms of data, say like clinical data from a patient's file. What do we know about symptoms, other tests? Mm -hmm. um, we also need to look at, we look at the RNA in this case, um, but this, this needs to be translated in protein. The protein is actually executing what what the RNA is telling it to do, basically. So it's also very important that we look at like what is expressed on the protein level and put all of this sort mm -hmm. of together to understand patterns in like what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the field is moving towards that a lot. There's a lot of research being done on like how do you deal with that because it's different kinds of data and how do you make that one big thing mm -hmm. to make sense of like, okay, we have these single cells, how do we now go back to the organ? How do we go back to the human exactly. being and actually translate this towards something that a clinician can use in the mm -hmm. clinic, uh -huh. for example? So we had a, a first step, step of all, like, you know, uh, uh, finding new cell types. We didn't know they were there, discovering new things. Now we need, we're on the process of putting everything together with all the data that is being generating across the world and trying to make sense and see how our understanding of the human body, the brain, is changing. So, yeah. so do you think that, you know, in, um, in some time in the future, whether, you know, near or later on, that um, single-cell technologies can be adapted to be used in the clinical setting or, you know, applications coming from this can be useful in either diagnosis or... Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> Me personally, absolutely yes. Not today because the techniques are very expensive. Yeah. So they are not use, they're not useful in a clinical setting. Uh -huh. uh, but the costs are decreasing. And so I can see that happening. Uh, Ten years ago, it was another technology. Bulk RNA sequencing was the new. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's uh, used mainstream everywhere. So I can see the same progression for the single cell technology. So yes. In the cancer setting, for instance, the cancer is like a small village. And so we have some cells that are in charge of generating metastasis, some cells that are in charge of fueling the tumor and making it uh, eat, et cetera. So the analysis of all these populations tells us a lot of the tumor. Uh, and so that applied to every pa patient can be very, very informative. So that's a little bit fiction right now because of the cost of each assay, uh -huh. but that's where we are. I hope we're going. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to achieve that, we also need to understand like 
if what's going on in the brain is actually also present in the blood, for example, because of course, if we're working with living people, we cannot just go and take a part of their brain. Um, so like one of the things that a lot of people are actually working on is trying to figure out, okay, we see that something is wrong in the brain. Can we see if that is reflected mm -hmm. in the blood or in the cerebrospinal fluid or some sort of way that we can easily measure this in the clinic? So I think if we can achieve that, then we can definitely use single cell sequencing in the clinic. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so maybe in the last few minutes that we have, uh, uh, let us uh, get to know you a little bit more. Yes, both of you. <laughs> so, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what, you know, tell us a little bit about you, your trajectory in science, you know, what made you choose what you chose, you know, as a line of work and what attracted you to use this type of technology. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, I am Dutch actually. I, I did my studies in the Netherlands, my bachelor and my master. Um, I was very interested in neuroscience and the immune system, so I was kind of trying to find something that combines both. So I sort of naturally arrived at multiple sclerosis research. Uh, went to Edinburgh in Scotland. There's a quite high rate of uh, MS in Scotland, so there's a lot of research there. And this is actually where I got my fascination with human brain research. Mm -hmm. um, I was training under a neurologist and was very lucky to work with a neuropathologist as well, um, who actually showed me how to take a brain out of a human being. How do you study this? How do you preserve a brain? Um, and they taught me a lot about how to look at these lesions because they're not all the same. They taught me the different gradations, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I was very much interested in how the immune system interacts uh, with, like, within these lesions. So how, how do, does it enter the brain? And uh, this is how I ended up here in Montreal because there is a lab here that looks at immune cells, how they uh, adhere to the blood-brain barrier and how they actually go into the brain. Uh, and then, as of by some sort of luck, um, Professor Pratt, who I worked with, actually had a brain bank, and he asked me to look after his brain bank. And over time, I started leading this autopsy program, so being able um, basically to take brains from people who are kind enough to donate to help other patients, because that's mostly, mostly it. they're very driven to actually help other patients. Um, and within this, I was able to um, reduce the post-mortem delay and this is the time between like someone passing away and, and the time that you actually have the tissue to use it for your different techniques in the lab. The shorter this is, um, the better it is for like the single cell sequencing uh, attempts that we're trying to do. And um, so we're now within two to six hours, which is one of the fastest in the world, uh, which allowed us to do these single cell genomic studies uh, as well, which is been great, and uh, I hope to keep continuing something like this at McGill as well. Also, um, yeah, using the Douglas Brain Bank, uh, of course, <laughs> with the brain tissue from there, and yeah, so my big fascination is looking at human brains. So you came to the right place, for yes, sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Uh, yeah, so you? my career path is not the standard one. I start, I'm, I'm from Argentina. I started uh, trying to do neuroscience, so biology degree, but then I got fascinated with computers. I quit science. I, I, I made my own startup 20 years ago. It was developing interactive uh, programs for uh, you know portals, which at the time was really cool. But it, at three years in, I miss science. I, uh, I realized I, lo I love the learning phase, but then uh, the business part, all that was not for me, excuse me for the business people here, but I miss science. And I was uh, in, in a conference, I was in Argentina, but they, 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 uh, I was, uh, I was uh, fortunate to go to a conference in the US about social responsibility and science, and there was uh, Eric Lander, who was the head of the NIH, yes. talking. And he stopped the talk, that was 20 years ago, and he said, you know, he was, talk he was talking about the human genome, and he said, you know, if there's any student in the room that likes biology and computer science, please, please follow that, because we're lacking those people right now. There's not, not you know, you're kind, there's no intersection be between the two disciplines. So I went back to home. It was one of those comments that people do in conferences that we don't realize that you may bend the life of people. So he bent my life, and so I we started looking for where I could join the two things I, I like, which was biology and computer science. And Canada was one of the first ones that had such a program. 
So that's how I came to Canada in 2003 to st study. Uh, and then I kept going. I did my PhD in evolutionary biology. It was very theoretical, very mathematical. When I finished, I wanted something more applied. And when I applied for my postdoc position, my CV didn't match at the Genome Center. And so uh, the, PI, the, the professor asked me, why do you want to do this? And I said, I think that got me the position. I said, I want to do something my, my parents understand. <laughs> it was pure math. So uh, I started there, and then slowly but surely, I went to, to more, more applied. And when I started the lab, I went back to neuroscience. Uh -huh. That's when I could go back to neuroscience. It was a full circle from the beginning. Right. And uh, yeah, I think the Latmer Center was just starting. Uh, I started the lab in 2014. Uh, so I was one of the first persons that was a new PI under the Latmer umbrella. So it also feels really nice to be here today uh, with somebody else being the young and being the old. <laughs> You're so, not that old. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. So how lucky Miguel mm -hmm. is to have both of you and, uh, having, and have attracted you both uh, to work here in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much for sharing your stories and sharing the work that you do in the lab. Um, thank you. I'm supposed to advance the slides and make remarks. Oh, thank you for joining us. Uh, that was a really interesting uh, discussion. Thank, thank you, all three of you, for, uh, for that conversation. Um, you know, I think we can, I hope the audience appreciates the fact that we're sort of at the, the cutting edge, literally the cutting edge of, of these technologies and both the promise and the, the rather daunting scientific challenges, which I can, I can certainly, I certainly heard that our uh, um, faculty, whether they're new or not quite so new, uh, are, are excited to, to take on. Um, and I said in my opening remarks that, that new methods drive new understanding, and I really think that this is a great uh, example. We didn't get into the details uh, of the kinds of new understandings, but um, I think you can hear the, the potential and possibility, and certainly as a clinician, I can, I, I'm like, hurry up. <laughs> it's clear that this is going to be, it's going to yield things that we can use uh, clinically, whether it's as a technique, but more importantly, as knowledge. Um, so um, so thanks. Thanks for the work and for the willingness to take on this kind of a challenge. This is, uh, this, you know, science is a pretty exciting space. I don't have to say that to this audience. Um, before you, uh, I let you get out uh, to mingle and uh, enjoy some refreshments and continue the conversation. Uh, let me officially thank our panelists, uh, Professor Claudia Kleinman, Professor Stephanie Zandi, and our moderator, Dr. Gustavo Turecki, and our partners, the Neuro, the Lady Davis, and the Douglas, who helped make this gathering possible, and also the Hospital Foundations for their, their close collaboration on this mission. This is um, just as there are complex interactions between cells in the brain. There can be at times be complex interactions between uh, institutes, uh, foundations, hospitals, and making that really work well is uh, maybe not quite as complicated as the brain, but sometimes a bit complicated. And when it works well, it has, is hugely powerful. Um, thank you to the McCord Stewart Museum and their staff uh, for their hospitality. What a great uh, space for this event, um, right across from McGill's downtown campus. And the audience turning out on a weeknight for your curiosity and interest in advancing mental health and brain research. We're really grateful to have everybody uh, present tonight. Merci de votre présence uh, parmi nous ce soir. And one more time, thank you to Freeman Lander and um, Irving Ludmer for uh, their, their trust and their vision. Um, I, think, I think we can, we can really see how that uh, vision is uh, going to lead to some really interesting uh, outcomes. I will stop talking and invite you to continue the conversation with each other, with our panelists um, during the reception. Je vous souhaite une excellente soirée. Et au plaisir d'échanger avec vous lors du cocktail qui se tiendra dans la salle voisine. Thank you. Thank you.